We're starting this episode out with a question that we are never going to have a good answer for. How many cells do animals have? I can already hear Simi scoffing some version of why is Hank Green asking me such an obviously unanswerable question while a rotifer chills out on my screen. And you're not wrong to be skeptical. There are a lot of animals in the world and a lot of cells inside those animals. How could one ever hope to count all of the cells in each of those animals? And how could we even begin to assume that the amount of cells in one individual is going to be the same for all the other individuals? And what even would be the point of treating every animal like a jar full of jelly beans that we need to guess the number of? Are you waiting for the twist? Because you know there's going to be a twist. Maybe you even know what the twist is already. Maybe you remember our video on rotifers all the way back in 2019, where we said this. Rotifers are eutelic, which means that from the moment they are born, they will have a fixed number of cells in their bodies for the rest of their life. For most rotifers, that number is around a thousand cells. And for the rotifer to grow, the cells themselves, which cannot divide, have to get bigger. Think about that for a second. We know how many cells are inside of a rotifer, which means that at some point in history, someone sat down and counted the cells in a rotifer. And they didn't just stop at one rotifer, they kept counting, going from rotifer to rotifer to rotifer until a simple truth appeared. All of these rotifers had the same number of cells as each other. So the rotifer is one of the few animals that we can treat like a jar full of countable beans. And it is because of this property called utile. The number of cells in the rotifer has been set, which means that if you're looking at a mature rotifer, you know that you are looking at about a thousand cells in action maybe a little more or a little less depending on the species, but within those species, all the individuals will be the same in this one very countable way. Now we had hoped at this point that maybe we could give you a fun exercise in historical imagination. We would ask you something like, what kind of person would have the patience to count all of the cells in a rotifer? And then we would give you the name of the scientist who did the counting and maybe even quote their writings on the subject. However, science has many dark pasts that weave through history, binding together our understanding of even the smallest creatures with the political and social forces that shape humanity. The word utile was brought into the biological vernacular because of a zoologist named Eric Martini, who in the beginning of the 20th century counted the cells in the rotifer species Hydatina senta and established the female individual had 958 somatic cells, meaning all of the cells apart from the individual's eggs. However, we have to add that in addition to Martini's contributions to our understanding of utile, his legacy also involves a debate between historians over whether he engineered a Nazi plot to spread malaria among Italian citizens in 1943, which would be considered an act of biological warfare. Martini was not the first, nor was he the last person to be associated with both important scientific discovery and Nazism. And while we could explore the question of how many cells are inside animals without making reference to him, we think that it's important not to gloss over the ugliness that often accompanies the history of science. Other scientists were also fascinated by Utile. In 1932, the scientist Harvey J. Van Cleve published his paper, Utile or Cell Constancy in its Relation to Body Size, confirming the cell counts that Martini had made in his rotifer studies while also describing evidence researchers had found for utile in animals like gastrotrix and nematodes, and other scientists would add tardigrades to that list. Every animal begins its life as a single cell that is full of destiny. It divides and divides and divides, sending cells tumbling down a path toward their fate as they take on specific shapes and functions that have been preordained through a combination of chemical and genetic cues. 
In most animals, including our own, many of those cells continue to divide, whether that's to help us grow or heal or adapt. So while scientists have estimated that humans have around 37.2 trillion cells, their estimate is by necessity, based on very restrictive assumptions about what a human body looks like. Ultimately, most of us will exist somewhere in a gray area of variation around that number. Some of us will have more, some of us will have less. Whether there's a deeper pattern underlying the disparities is hard to pin down, except for the fact that the heart of nature is diversity. But not for the rotifer. Sure, it started with an egg that divided and made more cells that followed a set path to their final fate, eventually growing into the mature, wheeled animals that we love to watch. But when the rotifer reaches maturity, it no longer makes any new cells. If it needs to grow, then the cells will grow, but they will not make new cells. And perhaps not needing to divide and make new cells creates a sort of peaceful constancy that means the rotifer doesn't need to waste energy on making new DNA and duplicating its cells. But it also means that if the rotifer gets hurt, it does not have the tools to make new cells to heal itself. We don't really have any idea of why rotifers or any other animal would become eutelic. There's no obvious phylogenetic relationship that exists between eutelic animals that we know of, and at times, identifying eutely in one species has led us to make incorrect assumptions about their relatives. That's because eutely itself is a diverse phenomenon. Some of those animals that we mentioned were eutelic? It turns out they are, but also they aren't. Tardigrades, for example, have storage cells that help distribute energy, but that also sometimes divide to make more storage cells. And some gastrotrichs have even been documented healing themselves after an injury. These may be cases of partial utility, while some parts of the animal do maintain some kind of constancy, while others do not. Or it may be that even within a phylum, the occurrence of eutely has no obvious logic to it. Maybe some gastrotrix are eutelic and some aren't. And as we said, those kinds of cases just add to the confusion of eutely. The nematode Cenorhabditis elegans has been such a popular model organism in part because we know that the adult C. elegans hermaphrodite has a body built out of 959 somatic cells. And knowing the path from egg to embryo to juvenile to adult through the story of those 959 somatic cells has been a tremendous gift to science. It's a blueprint of the worm's development, a pattern that scientists can prove and disrupt to uncover other hidden motifs. But it turns out that C. elegans eutely is not the shared trait it was once thought to be among nematodes. Free-living marine nematodes were found not to have it, and other species have been found whose skin is dotted with a different number of nuclei, revealing variation where previous scientists had not expected any. And so, even in these unusual cases where it seems like maybe we can get closer to quantifying the number of cells in an animal, the simple act of counting paints a much more complicated picture of our world. Nature loves to change even if that is a change towards a bizarre case of constancy. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. And thank you to all of the people whose names are on the screen right now. They are our patrons. They, in a way, are like the individual cells that make up the body of journey to the microcosmos's funding. Look, there are a bunch of people who decided that they want content like this to exist on the internet, and in order to make sure it happens, they support us at patreon.com slash journey to micro, which you can find a link to in the description. Check it out, see if you would like to join them. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James Weiss, you can check out Jam and Germs on Instagram, and if you want to see more from us, there's always a subscribe button somewhere nearby.